And good afternoon, board members. The school district has had the pleasure of collaborating with a number of outstanding medical professionals, both here locally as well as nationally, on items since the pandemic has started to really guide our decision making. Most recently, we've been engaged in conversations, as Mr. Burke stated, regarding metrics to really guide our decisions about when to safely reinstate masks to be opt out. So at this time, I'm going to go through some of that presentation about that feedback we received. In addition, after I go through those uh, items, Dr. Alonzo, appreciate you being here tonight. She's been my, my right-hand person through all this. Thank She's you. gonna unpack that data a little bit deeper. And then some exciting news uh, regarding the vaccination for children ages five to 11. Dr. Andrick will give some updates about what's on the front for that. So. The CDC, the CDC's COVID-19 COVID track tool is used to assess a county's level of county, uh, community transmission over the past seven days. The CDC looks at two numbers or two indicators. They look at the total new cases and the percent positivity to determine the level of community transmission. The first, the total new cases uh, per 100,000 in the past seven days this is one of the first items. To calculate this number, the CDC divides the total number of new cases or infections by the total population. So for us, it's about 1.5 million in that county, and then they multiply that number by 100,000. With the percent positivity, we look at the past seven days, the number of positive tests, and to calculate that number, it's the total number of positive tests divided by the total number of tests performed in the county, and there is a little caveat of the type of tests that are used, and then that number is multiplied by 100,000. So if you get your calculator out, we're gonna get to take a little test on that right now to see if you can do this. Just kidding. So <laughs> a higher number of the total new cases um, in each of, the, and a higher percent of positivity corresponds obviously with a higher level of transmission in a community. It's important to note that if either of these values, one of the metrics or one of these values is in the higher category, you would use that for the transmission level. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So based on that information and working closely with our medical professional colleagues, these are the indicators that we'll use to reinstate face coverings to allow in, in going back to opt out. There's a lot of discussion around the vaccination and the particular the parents of children ages 5 to 11 to not have the opportunity to have their children vaccinated so the covid vaccine so the covid vaccination for children ages 5 to 11 years of age and allowing those parents that choice to vaccinate their children would be the first um, item to going back to opt out and more update on that again in just a few minutes with dr andrick the average new cases of COVID-19 per 100,000 persons would be at the moderate level of transmission risk, and I'll unpack that in just a second. The positivity rate for COVID-19 would also be at the moderate level of transmission risk. And both of those two indicators would be maintained at the moderate level for four weeks. I'll unpack to that time frame. When we talk about the average new cases of COVID-19 per week, in particular at the moderate level, we're talking about cases being below 50 or uh, below 50 over a seven week average. Again, that's between 10, 10 to 50 at the, at the moderate level. And just to note, as of September 30th, as reported by the Florida Department of Health, the average number of weekly cases was at 162 per 100,000 persons here in Palm Beach County. The positivity rate at the moderate uh, transmission risk is at five to 7.99%. Again, reported by the Florida Department of Health as of September 30th, the positivity rate was 6.5% for Palm Beach County. So with all of those metrics and, and with all those indicators in place is when we would consider to, with, when we would move to mask being opt out. So we have seen over time a number of spikes over our, this pandemic. And so we do need to have ongoing monitoring and when we would re reinstate mandated face coverings, which is a very important item. So face masks being mandated again, what we would use is two weeks of one of the indicators for the community transmission at the substantial or high level. 
So going back to this chart here, you would see if the substantial for new cases is 50 or greater. Again, what we said earlier, it's 162 currently. And for the uh, positivity rate, above 8%. So currently it's at 6.5, last reported by the Florida Department of Health, that's under the moderate. So here we have a high transmission currently and a moderate for new cases and moderate transmission for positivity. As, so the ranking would automatically put us in the high transmission, which also currently the state of Florida is in high transmission. So before we go into questions to this, Dr. Alonzo is gonna unpack this a little bit deeper and kind of look at some data over time and how that has played out here in Palm Beach County. Um, it's the forward, the arrow? Yep. Mm -hmm. Makes me forward. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Chairman, Mr. Barbieri, and um, Superintendent, Mr. Burke, and of course, the rest of your staff, all the board members, and uh, everyone visiting, and all the staff that's around us. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you, Keith, and uh, thank you for keeping all this work and going forward. So um, let's start with um, that map. Uh, I'll show you the, the, the map in terms of the United States. All the, st the community transmission is looked at at a state level and it's looked at a county level. All this information is on the cdc.gov uh, COVID tracker. You can see all this information for yourself on those web pages and you can look at it every single day. Right now in the United States, it's all in red except for California and a tiny little, does this have a little um, pointer? Or no. it, it doesn't show up there. But anyway, um, in, in Connecticut, there's a tiny little bit of orange in Connecticut. And Puerto Rico is the only um, uh, territory that we have that is in moderate at this time. Back in June, we were in moderate. We were the first metro county to go to moderate um, back in June. So. That's where we are. Now, in terms of Florida, you can see that we're all in red with the exception of Glades and Henry. So this information that Keith is talking about shows us why we are in red. If you see to the right where I have the um, new cases positivity for last week, it's at 6.5, which would indicate that it is in the... Um, you go to the bottom where, where you show the positivity, right? That's the bottom part that says percentage of positivity. And 6.5 falls between 5 and 7.9. So we would be for moderate in terms of positivity. But for our cases per 100,000, we're at 162. And that dropped by 34 points from the previous seven days. Um, so we're going in the right direction. And we probably will continue to go in the right direction for several weeks until we start into the winter um, and holidays. So um, because we're at 162, it's above 100%, so therefore you pick the level that is the highest to give you the indication for your risk in your community for transmission of the virus. This is the rest of the data for um, Palm Beach. Uh, we always compare it with Florida to see where, we're, where we are. And in addition to the uh, new case positivity in the cases per 100,000, we, we also try to look at our total percent of 12-year-olds and older that are vaccinated. That's on the second line. So right now, that number is 74. Now, what our real number that we want to talk about, I have another slide for vaccination, because the total vaccination means the people that have only one dose plus those who have completed their series. And for protection, what you really want to look at is the complete vaccination or the completed series. So that's um, in the 60s, 64 right now. So we really want to look at that, although we report the total vaccine because it's higher. So what we did um, after looking at this and realizing that we want to take a look at this metric, we wanted to see what we looked like um, starting when we started reporting when the emergency order uh, was dropped and we opened up, um, we, we stopped our emergency order, we started reporting our data 
direct only once a week, and that data is what goes to the CDC. And there's only certain data that's being reported. The rest of the data is considered um, not for public consumption, and therefore that um, is protected. So the information goes in terms of the new cases per 100,000 and the positivity rate are both included. So you can see that on the left hand, on the data that's at the week of June 11th, we reached the, high, the lowest part of our cases per 100,000. It was 44.4. I don't think you can see that, can you? Unless you got super eyes. You can see it? Okay. So it, that was the lowest we reached. Then we started going up and we peaked on the week of August 13th through the 19th at 622.9. At that point, we were seeing over 6,000 cases per week. So over 1,000, we, we were reaching um, almost over 1,000 cases per day. So, um, and then now we're coming down, and now we're at that 162 that you saw in the previous um, chart. So our positivity, the, the lowest was on June 11th, where we reached 44.4%. Oh, I, I didn't skip. I didn't move that. <laughs> there we go. Okay. The, the lowest was on June 4th, one week before, where our new case positivity rate reached 29 so we were very, very close to going actually into the blue, which was low. Um, but our number of cases was high, so we, didn't, we, we stayed under moderate only. So our highest positivity was uh, during the week of August the 8th, uh, the 13th, where we reached 17.9. That was the highest positivity rate. And now we've been coming down to the, to the 6.5 that I'm talking about. So you can see that even though we were hitting that low at the beginning of June, um, we, we almost made it to the low, but we still had those high cases. So it is possible to get down to that number, and that's when we were feeling really good. People thought COVID was over. People kept saying, hey, well, it, it's over. It's gone. But COVID will never go away. These viruses never go away. H1N1 that was here in the pandemic in 2009 is still circulating and it will continue to circulate in the world. What happens is that eventually we get um, immunity either by natural um, infection or by the vaccinations. So let's talk about the vaccinations. Uh, this graph shows you where we've broken them out by ages. So in, in the uh, chart, you see that the number completed is 64 and the total is 74. We've gone up by 2%. Now, as of the 4th, we have went up another 3%. So now we're at 67 fully vaccinated in Palm Beach County. And that means that we are at 77 for total vaccines. Now, you can see that this number is hyperinflated because you have the top lines, which are your 69 in red, and the dark blue, the 70 to 79, those folks are above 90%. So when you take the average of these numbers, it makes it higher because we also have the younger age groups down to 50%. So the two blue lines on the bottom, the light blue is the 20 to 29, and the dark blue line on the bottom is the 12 to 19 year olds. So we've broken those out especially so that you can see the kids that are in school and that are able to be vaccinated. They have taken the vaccine and surpassed the 20 to 29 year olds. So they're almost at about 55, 56%. As we vaccinate more of those people, those, those three groups are the ones that we need to get up to the 70% so that we can have more protection in the community. So, I also want to talk a little bit about the boosters because there's been a lot of confusion with folks and I want everybody here and yourselves included to be able to explain this to your constituents and to other folks um, in your neighborhoods and your churches. 
Um, the term booster is only used for Pfizer vaccine at this time, which the FDA approved only for Pfizer. You have to be 65 and older, um, or you have to be 18 and living in a long-term care facility, um, have an underlying medical condition, or work or live in a high-risk setting. And those high-risk settings include uh, people who are first responders, that includes healthcare workers, firefighters, police, congregate care staff. It also includes all the education staff, so teachers, support staff, daycare workers, uh, anybody working within the school system, uh, the food, agriculture, manufacturing workers, also correction workers, U.S. postal workers, and uh, public transit workers, and even grocery store workers, so people that are in constant contact with the public qualify for these high-risk settings. All those people who have Visor, who got the Visor vaccine, can go and ask for a booster. The third dose, when you ask for a third dose, you can have gotten Pfizer or Moderna, but you have to be moderate to severely compromised in, with your immune system. In other words, that is the, the third dose is for people whose immunity system is not working as well as it should. And so for that, you have to go to your CVS or your Walgreens um, where they have the vaccine that you got, and you have to sign a paper saying that you're immunocompromised. And that is specifically for people who are, have an organ transplant, HIV or AIDS, actively on chemotherapy. In other words, you're getting cancer treatment at this time, not that you got it in the past, but that you're actively on it, or you're taking immunosuppression medications, such as people who have severe rheumatoid arthritis who take this medication, therefore their immune system is low. So if you can remember to ask for the right thing, you can get it. But what happens is that sometimes, because these, it's the same vaccine, it's the same bottle of medicine that you're gonna get, the same shot, but if you ask for the wrong thing, let, let's say you had Moderna and you walk into the, um, the Publix and you say, hey, I want my booster for Moderna. They're going to say, I'm sorry, that's not available yet. And they're right. But if you say, I want my third shot for Moderna because I'm immunocompromised, then you will get your shot. So it's a matter of using the right terminology and they don't actually explain it to you. They just tell you, we're sorry, that's not available yet. <laughs> So people get confused and very frustrated, and um, it's created a little bit of a um, problem with people understanding this. So I, I hope this clears it up, because I know we get a lot of questions on this. So uh, in closing, I just want to um, let everybody realize that we still have the Delta virus. It's 100% uh, of the variants right now for all practical purposes. It's the predominant variant across the whole United States. It's very contagious and it's causing breakthrough cases. The vaccinations remain the most important tool to stop the spread and save lives. In addition to that, the other mitigations, such as wearing our masks, washing our hands, um, sanitizing the touch surfaces, and the distancing are also obviously very important. Hospitalizations have decreased. The, the hospitals are now more stable. Um, they have, uh, they're um, discharging more patients with COVID than they're admitting. Um, the unvaccinated patients remain the predominant admissions with 84% uh, being unvaccinated. Uh, fewer children are being admitted. They're, they only make up 3% now of the admissions of the 197 admissions that we had. Um, and 5% of the kids are in the ICU only. So those numbers have gone down. So we're going in the right direction but it's still in high transmission. We also need to be prepared in case of another surge, um, and that will come in the winter. It always comes in the winter because the virus goes to the southern hemisphere and then comes back to the northern hemisphere in the winter. That's the way the viruses move. Now, we've had a lot of transmission, so not all the virus has left, but it's normal for, to see a decline in the summer and then have it come back up in the winter. So we have to be ready for it. We don't want to get caught behind the um, eight ball on this. So we have to be ready for it and make plans. I am um, 
cautiously optimistic that um, because we're doing such a good job with vaccinations that we will be able to hold this back and not have the surge that we had in January last year. So if we all do our part, I encourage everyone to get vaccinated, protect yourself, protect your family and the rest of the community. I think if we all work together on this, we will be able to continue to battle this virus and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alonzo. Now, Dr. Andrick's going to provide some updates as it relates to the vaccination for ages 5 to 11 year olds. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, usually I give you update on the school nurses and numbers that we have in the school, but as you know, my agency was one of the main vaccinators in our community. And as that, we uh, worked all summer with the school district providing our mobile clinic uh, readily available and accessible to parents uh, 12 to 18 during the summer to receive their COVID vaccines. And we extended that um, for last four weeks. I think we are in week five. Uh, we are finishing second shots of the, sec of the second round going back to the high schools. Uh, we anticipate by the next week we will complete that project of high schools and we will conclude that with the around 1,000 vaccines given on the campuses predominantly to the 12 to 18. Some employees, some family members, few, very few boosters, but majority of them are kids. So um, some want to say it's a low number. I think it's a high number considering the general interest for vaccines that we experience. The same team, I always say that, that is giving six, that takes now six weeks to give 1,000 vaccine, used to give 5,000 per day. Uh, in the past, but uh, we'll take it. Uh, and um, it's, I think it's a successful program. It worked well. We, we parked the bus on different high schools, uh, two per day. And as I said, we went back to give second shots. That being said, um, and today uh, Mr. Keith uh, presented a plan that is a little bit tidying to the vaccines available to all aged children, five and, uh, and 12. We are very concerned that we have as we are talking about changing our mitigation strategies in communities, um, that we are doing that before vaccine is available for all our age groups. And luckily, um, we are hearing that FDA already has a um, um, meeting scheduled on and, and end of October where the um, uh, Pfizer vaccines will be approved for ages 5 to 12. In anticipation of that, uh, of course, I don't have a crystal ball, but in anticipation of that, in strong anticipation, anticipation of a vaccine be, being file, finally available for age of 5 to 12, we are already mobilizing our planning. Um, again, my agency is of last resort. We are not going to go if there are other <laughs> community partners to do that. We don't compete with anyone. But we anticipate that we will be in a situation that we will have high interest for this vaccine from the parents and that we want to give vaccines in record time. We are also learning that pharmacists have, pharmacists have limitation in age. So um, we are learning that pharmacists cannot give vaccines at, at the present time for people younger than nine years of age. So that's going to kind of uh, eventually create, if, if, if nothing changed until that time, that can create another barrier uh, for this vaccine. So we want to be ready. We were just talking here behind today. We're going to deploy all our mobile clinics and we're going to come up with a plan uh, that we make again readily available for people through uh, locations the school district provides uh, and convenient for them on the way to school or on the way out of the school because parents need to be present and give consent. So we are making that plan. Um, fingers crossed that vaccine is available. Uh, I think that we all know that vaccine is the best, as Dr. Alonzo just shared. Uh, and reminded everybody, um, a vaccine is our best weapon um, and tool that we go out of this pandemic and move to endemic. And as we are relaxing those mitigation strategies uh, reasonably, uh, we have to be sure that all of our parents and children has vaccine available and make decision, of course, but um, many are um, would be upset that we change mitigation strategies if we don't have available vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Andrick and Dr. Alonzo. So again, just summarizing these four indicators, again, at the moderate level for transmission risk for over a four-week period, and then the vaccination available to children 5 to 11 years of age, and with the other physicians that we've had contact with, uh, some with uh, deep studies in epidemiology, indicating the data they indicate show hopefully that FDA approval It's the end of the month. So uh, at this time, We'll go ahead and turn it back to you, Mr. Burke, and the board, if there's any questions. Board members, do you have any questions for the doctors or Mr. Oswald? Oh, 
Thank you very much. Thank you both for coming to see us. Thank you. I appreciate Mr. Oswald immersing himself in his much. work and the ongoing support of our medical partners here.